let's move on to the clinical phenotype three. This can be a little bit tricky because here I brought an example with atrial fibrillation with a case of heart failure with definitely reduced ejection fraction. So this ejection fraction is definitely not above 50%, but below 40%. It's, I would say, from the visual aspect in the range of 30%. But, and this is very important, I brought to this example because it so nicely shows what the problem of a patient with atrial fibrillation can be. Because atrial fibrillation can, per se, of course, cause dyspnea, but, and that's important, atrial fibrillation can lead to heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because it's a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. And it overall leads to an elevation of left atrial pressures, which also can, on the other hand, cause atrial fibrillation. So it's a vicious circle. When you're once in this circle, it's very hard to get out and we have to help those patients. In this case, we do see a severely enlarged left and a severely enlarged right atrium also Even we do not see the right ventricular wall here properly, we can assume that the right ventricle is dilated. And we do see also the left ventricle is to a certain degree dilated. The walls are not severely thickened, but still there is a certain degree of LVH present. And it's important to note that in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is fairly high. With a patient who also has atrial fibrillation, we do see the enlarged right and left atrium. We do see the calcified valves, even calcifications here at the beginning of the LVOT, so also the aortic valve. We see just a little bit of the aortic valve over here is calcified. But left ventricular function in this case seems preserved. It's in the range of 50% in this apical four chamber view. In the context of this clinical phenotype of atrial fibrillation, Of course, we have to note that AFib and HFPF have common risk factors. Of course, the metabolic syndrome, hypertension, and we have the so-called chicken and egg problem. What was first the case? Was it atrial fibrillation or was it HFPF? So HFPF leading to AFib or atrial fibrillation leading to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Overall, the consequence is that we have an elevation of BNP, so the brain atriatic peptide, we have heart failure symptoms, and of course, left atrial dilatation. We are not done yet with atrial fibrillation because also atrial fibrillation can lead to severe secondary mitral regurgitation. So in case of a dilated left atrium, we can have a severe mitral regurgitation. This is a different example. So you have to differentiate in between secondary mitral regurgitation due to, for example, LA dilatation or left ventricular dilatation and differentiate it from severe primary MR. This is a patient where you see an example of a severe MR, but this is due to a primary cause. This patient had a prolapse and a partial flay leaflet. Why am I showing you this? Well, of course, the severe mitral regurgitation also can lead to left atrial dilatation and also can lead to atrial fibrillation, which then Also, you have to think about when you think about reconstruction of the mitral valve and operation of the mitral valve. So here we have atrial fibrillation, a severe mitral regurgitation, which was the cause for left atrial dilatation and atrial fibrillation and the left ventricular hyperdynamic function. Overall, rhythm control and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with atrial fibrillation, we do not know if that actually helps or benefits our patients. Here I want to show you more examples of the case we have seen. So the patient with atrial fibrillation, hyperdynamic left ventricular function, and here the posterior mitral valve leaflet, probably in the region of P2 here. And this is a patient with thickened heart, also a thickened mitral valve, so by means uh, of a morbus barlow and due to this prolapse and this probably partial flail, you see quite a bit here, it's very, very subtle. You have severe mitral regurgitation. The next clinical phenotype we have to talk about is the phenotype of pulmonary hypertension. In pulmonary hypertension, we know that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction we know leads to endothelial dysfunction in the pulmonic vasculature. So we have a problem already very often in rest, but even more so during exercise. The pulmonary arteries, they're normally a low pressure system. So it's causing more oxidative stress. It leads to 
RV dilatation and overall to right ventricular dysfunction as well. That creates a secondary tricuspid regurgitation, which causes the right ventricle even more to fail. So again, we have this vicious circle where we have the dilatation of the right ventricle, the reduction in function, the coaptation defect of the tricuspid valve and TR, and that leads to even a further deterioration of right ventricular function and a more severe dilatation. In the short axis, we also do see this prominent right ventricle, the prominent trabecular system, the prominent moderator band, the small but thick left ventricle, so the small cavity and the thick left ventricular walls, and this D shape of the left ventricle showing elevated pulmonary pressures as well.